this is about while we have heard while we have heard the efforts uh, and contributions from people on the giving side uh, there are real heroes on the ground who make things happen by actually putting what you know earlier ronnie and amit said sort of sort of referred to as sweat equity people who get things done on the ground and we have three stellar examples uh, today for the next 45 minutes for them to walk us through their own stories on how they have enabled change by being there on the front lines uh to kick off uh, this discussion or this uh, uh, sort of talk uh, this is going to be a series of flash talks uh, by three individuals who are on the front lines making things happen every day uh to begin with uh, we have uh, we have siddharth chatterji uh, who's a un resident coordinator uh, who's joining us from nairobi today um so siddharth has been on the front he likes to refer himself as a soldier turned humanitarian and siddharth it's been a pleasure knowing about you in the last few days leading up to the event uh, i have grown to be a huge fan of your articles and your interviews that you have given in various places uh, i will not uh, take any more time would love to hear a version of how you your transition from a soldier to humanitarian uh, and your stints across several countries i think the list keeps getting longer every time i read it so uh, the floor is all yours over to you siddharth to help us understand your journey and your perspective thank, thank you very much sri ram and happy independence day to all the viewers who who are online so so yes my my transition in life was from an officer in the indian army where i served in a special forces unit and was in always in the front lines of combat there and what i realized is that in these arenas of conflict which i was part of in terms of preventing it from happening there was one particular group that was worst affected by all the conflicts all the fragility all the instability and which is something i saw in my journey when i left the army in 1997 i've lived and worked in different countries in the world from somalia to iraq to south sudan to sudan uh, you know indonesia darfur is a common characteristic of a vulnerable group which is women and often that is a group which is left out even in the planning narrative we focus on you know rebuilding improving our outcomes for population that have been affected by conflicts and disasters but never have we disaggregated it to look at women in particular and i'm talking about the entire you know from from the from the girl child to to the grandma and in a country like ours and i have to be quite brutally frank as an indian citizen it is unlikely because in india has often stacked the deck against women from an early age with unequal opportunities at work stubbornly low representation of women leaders in the public and private sectors the continuing scourge a scourge of child marriage the tragedy of female feticide and sexual violence a census uh, for example in punjab from 2011 to 2014 revealed that for every 895 women there are about 1000 men perhaps one of the worst sex ratios in the country inequality and violence against women and girls starts before birth india's minister uh, maneka gandhi once said that every day around 2000 girls are killed in the womb or immediately after birth in india the violence and inequality continues with 40% of the world's child marriages happening in india my own grandmother was married at the age of 11 she had nine children and you know i i i have seen uh, her and my memory of her is one of a very feeble emaciated absolutely helpless person who's just been used as a brood mare in the household and robbed of any potential opportunity and robbed of the potential of being a mother and a grandmother in the real sense simply because her body had become so weak and fragile with these repeated childbirths that you know her, her existence in many ways became pretty inconsequential added to that is the is the malevolent presence of 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 patriarchy and misogyny in in india and india is not an exception to this there are many other parts of the world but we could certainly be doing better now let, let's take another statistic which is far more heartbreaking the national crimes bureau uh, records bureau says that on an on an average 92 women are raped in india every day a survey compiled by the thomson reuters foundation lists the democratic republic a democratic republic of congo afghanistan pakistan 
India and Somalia as the five worst states for women's rights in descending orders. Now we should be shocked at this. Today is India's Independence Day and I hope we could actually rekindle that flame of hope of equality in this country. In India, cultural preferences for boys has led to many pre uh, parents to treat their da daughters unequally. Others are unwilling to invest in the, in the education of their children because they, they see it as a, as a waste and conferring more potential economic gains on the family she's married into. India has been on the cusp of a global economic superpower status, but for years. What is really holding it back in my view is how Indian women are repeatedly held back by our own society. The lack of women in leadership, especially in the public space, in government, in civil administration, in law, is a major impediment for the country's global aspirations. I firmly believe that India has not stood by its women. Less than 10% of, uh, of them are of high court judges are women. And in India's lower house of parliament, barely about 12% uh, of the members are women. India ranks very low in having women in leadership roles. In 2016, there were only 17 female CEOs in the top 500 companies listed in India. The only thing that separates Indian women from those in the, in the Western world in, in the US, in Japan, and many other places where we have seen progress and great economic uh, trajectories is circumstances and opportunities. According to the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, adult literacy amongst women as a percentage of what their male counterparts in India is at about 67.6%. Statistics for women's health are even grimmer. Prevalence of contraceptive use is only at about 54.8%. Maternal mortality ratios uh, in, in 2015 was at about 170 deaths per 100,000 live births. Only about 37% of pregnant women had the, had the recommended minimum four antenatal visits and, and while giving birth. Statistics on economic in, empowerment are equally dreadful. According to the International Labour Organization, the participation of Indian women in the labour force fell from 37% in 2004-2005 to about 29% in 2009-2010 to about 23% in about 2015-2016, making us at around 11th from the bottom out of 131 countries in this regard, well behind uh, Brazil and China. So India currently needs to break the chains of dependency that have too long hobbled the girls' dreams and the, from the day they enter school. When girls stay in primary school for just one extra year, it can boost eventual wages by 10 to 20%. With education, women will seize the opportunity to support themselves, their families, their communities, through the dignity of work to control the futures and to have a voice in their communities. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that India's GDP could rise by 8% if the male to female ratio in the workplace was increased by a mere 10%. Imagine generations of Indian women allowed to thrive by living, by being given the same education as men, allowed to complete their, uh, uh, you know, have complete control over their health and career opportunities, including their bodies, their sexual reproductive health and rights being inviolable. Women are half of India's demographic dividend, ladies and gentlemen, and if given the right tools and community support, they can not only become financially independent, but become the but the engines of India's future economic growth. So we must continue to remind ourselves on the importance of gender equality, women's rights, women's empowerment, firmly at the center of the stage of, of, of our development agenda. Now, for as long as gender equality remains elusive, the pursuit of sustainable and inclusive greatness, economic greatness, will continue to remain you know, short of the real potential that this country has. A key area on the prevention of sexual gender-based violence, which is something that is hurtful for any Indian when we see every other day a newspaper carrying you know, episodes of, of sexual violence being, being brought on. And this is just something which is uncharacteristic of a country that has so many female goddesses, which has which, which, which had actually en enshrined women into positions of, 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 of great prominence and at the same time treat them with such you know, contempt and indignity. So from a policy perspective, here is a recommendation I have to make. And this may sound rather unorthodox, 
but then I served in a very unorthodox unit of the Indian Army. India today can actually change this narrative. It has a group of people that can help to change this narrative. Not too long ago, reflecting on the scourge of sexual gender-based violence in India, I talked about the might of the ex-military, the ex-servicemen in India. Did you know that we have about 1.3 million people in active duty and about 2.1 million in, in, in our reserve forces? It is one of the largest militaries in the world. And these are men and women who are educated, disciplined, skilled, and respect a chain of command. The tragedy of sexual and gender-based violence in India needs to be viewed from a national security prism. There are insurmountable problems today in India that ex-servicemen could tackle. The tragedy of sexual and gender-based violence in India has reached epidemic pro uh, proportions and needs to be viewed from that national security perspective. And in order to do that, I propose where the ex-military strengths are needed the most is in the protection of the rights of every woman and every girl. The Indian Armed Forces instill a very powerful leadership skills in their ranks that don't just vanish on retirement, combined with a deep sense of honor and discipline. Moreover, veterans, also have who have retired also feel a deep sense of purpose and service that can be channeled into upholding the rights of women and girls. This then serves a dual purpose, that of furthering human rights and women's rights and equality in India and providing those ex-servicemen who are highly well-trained, who are just sitting in their villages, you know, looking, living off their pensions into something where they could actually be of great use to their communities. They can add value by becoming champions of speaking up at the community level for the rights of women and girls, supporting and assisting local authorities in a massive advocacy campaign throughout India on gender equality and human rights. They can be easily taken to scale from house to house, community to community. Now, this could become part of an information network that also keeps an eye on episodes of violence against women and girls and ensures law enforcement is kept appraised. And as long as highly, uh, as people, uh, the ex servicemen are highly regarded, even to date, in their respective communities, they can play an important role in preventing sexual and gender based violence. They don't need financial remunerations because they already get a, get a pension. What they have is a deep sense of service before self. Why can't we not look at galvanizing this huge human resource, a huge human capital, which is here in our country? capable of providing great service to, to, the, to the country, and particularly when it comes to advancing the issue of rights, the issue of equality. So all the evidence points to the fact that India's future is truly dependent on its youth and women. Empowering, educating, employing India's women therefore becomes critical to India's economic progress. The ex-service personnel are a formidable soft power that can uphold the human rights and India's women's uh, for women's and girls and ensure their future. And thus, we as a nation state secure our own. So I would want to highlight the criticality of keeping in mind that without an affirmative action of a push towards equality, we would not be able to achieve the real economic potential that our country holds. With that, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Siddharth. I think uh, you quite emphatically uh, presented uh, and articulated the case for investment in women. Uh, I think although many of us understand it in theory, I think uh, your own life examples uh, and experience have clearly demonstrated the value of doing so, uh, not only in the short term, but also the long term as well. So thank you so much, uh, Siddharth, uh, uh, you know, for enlightening us. Uh, we next have, uh, as a continuation, since we focused on the theme of women, uh, we have a small change. I think I would like to call upon Shabna Aziz next. Uh, Shabnam leads Educate Girls Adolescent Girls program in Ajmer, where she has designed and implemented initiatives aimed at facilitating the transition of girls from primary to lower secondary education, increasing therefore the gender parity within schools and raising the bar on lower secondary completion rates. Uh, she's also been one of the frontline change makers uh, who's been at this for a very, very long time. And over to you, Shabnam, for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, thank you, Shri Ram. Uh, probably I'm not visible on the video. Can it be turned on? 
Sure. Uh, Shabnam, your video is on. Is your background all right? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're visible now. Please okay. go ahead. <laughs> Zindabad Sathyo, today is uh, Independence Day, so warm wishes to everybody. I'm Shabna Maziz. As a social sector professional, I have worked with and for adolescent girls and women. I'm armed with more than 24 years of experience with multitude of NGOs, central and state government departments, and international agencies. Throughout my career, I have gained a rich exposure and understanding in various capabilities and capacities and levels of planning and implementation at both state and community levels on the issues of uh, children, women, and marginalized communities. Being an educated woman from minority community myself, I'm endowed with deep commitment to the values of equality, secularism, as well as gender equity. I'm a strong agent of modern and progressive approach to the protection, care, and empowerment of children and adolescents. And now I educate girls. I joined the NGO of that very name, Educate Girls, in 2017, an organization that has spent the last 12 years uh, working with communities for girls' education. And till date, we have enrolled 7,50,000 girls in schools. We work in the most remote rural communities, experiencing the deepest learning crisis and the widest gender gap. Villages where 40% of the Indian out-of-school girls reside. With the help of more than 13,000 gender champions, our team Balika volunteers, we are driving the right to educate, educate uh, the right to educate uh, education act in the field, especially for girls. We have mobilized communities to question prevailing gender biases. The prevailing gender biases against girls, women, adolescents, and we have worked in government primary schools <coughs> to deliver child-centric curriculum remedial classes that help in improving the learning levels of all the children in school. The work I oversee presently was commenced in 2017 when we initiated our work with adolescent girls striving to reduce the gender gap in secondary education. This year, we were embarking on an ambitious five-year plan to tackle the problem out of school girls in India's remotest villages and we had committed to enroll about 1.5 million girls back in school, tackling the key barriers of poverty and patriarchy that deny so many girls education. But now COVID-19 has made both these challenges much worse. The economic shock due to job losses, reverse migration, both has plunged families back into poverty. The achievement of sustainable development goals, my dear friend, seems to be under threat. Alongside the economic factors that are crippling communities, as uh, my preceding uh, panelists spoke about, there is an emerging regression to all the age-old gendered roles in households. As families are cooped up, anxieties are high, and children are not in school. We are seeing domestic duties falling straight back onto the shoulders of young girls in homes. We are seeing 17 times increase in domestic abuse cases. India's emergency child helpline, as you all know, received 92,000 SOS messages, and that was just within 11 days of lockdown. Distress calls to the National Commission for Women Helpline at Delhi was found to be doubled. So with patriarchy back at play, and girls' vulnerability shooting back up. School will become a distant memory for so many, and re-enrollment will become near impossible to lot many. I would like to share a case from the place where I work because you asked what mobilizes you or inspires you. I talk about the girl, her name is Suman. She resides in Ajmer. And we had constituted Kishori Samu's Council of adolescent girls in villages. She is active member of one of such Kishori Samus. Uh, she has two sisters and one brother who studies in grade nine, but in a private school, while one sister is in grade eight and she studies in government school. 
and the other one she is uh, quite young right now and she is not enrolled has not started school suman herself is an 8th grade dropout she has been enrolled by us and we were preparing her to write her open school examination as the pandemic hit the family lost all sources of income and they became dependent on the ration that was being provided by the panchayat with great assistance and help they were able to seek manrega card in these times and this became their only source of income but we all know that the payments under manrega are not made on regular basis or daily basis once in fortnight while liquor shops reopened as the government started using the lockdown rules uh, suman's alcoholic father who was drinking country made liquor uh, bet suman her sister her mother to take away whatever money was in the house few days later he sold off what gas cylinder which was the only valuable asset in the house so that he could buy more alcohol for himself now the family has to collect wood every day to cook meals on chulha uh, with no other income left and very little options available to sustain themselves suman may not be able to write her exams her sister may not go back to school their new reality forces their mother to visit nearby township for mazduri daily wage earning suman and her sister have to now attend to their ailing grandmother take care of the infant sister cook take care of other household chores her grandmother wants to marry her off she says यहाँ काम करने से अच्छा है अपने घर जाए अपने पति के साथ रहे घर संभाले यहाँ उस पर निगाह कौन रखेगा कुछ ऊंच नीच हो गई तो किसी लड़के के साथ भाग गई तो अभी तो कम खर्च में शादी हो जाएगी बिकॉज दे स्ट्रिक्टी फॉलो द नियम इम्पोज बाय गवर्नमेंट दैट नो मो बराती इज एक्सेप्ट फॉर फिफ्टी इन नंबर सो शी विल फॉलो दैट बट चाइल्ड मैरिज नो शी इज ओके विद दैट एंड शी सेस अभी कोई रोकने वाला नहीं है बिकॉज एवरीबडी इज इन करोना so for those who could not understand the grandmother says rather than doing domestic chores here it's better that she goes and manages her husband's house stays there while both her parents are away i cannot keep an eye on this girl what if she talks with a boy or runs away due to restrictions we have to spend less on marriage so it's better that she gets married and goes back to her home and there are not people around functionaries to control child marriage because of corona they have been assigned other duties so we are free to do whatever we be like doing right now it's not i mean uh, while talking about her i can feel the goosebumps and my throat <clears throat> needs some water to uh... in india schools were shut since middle of march while many of those schools have moved to online courses online classrooms as i said Suman's brother also attends online classes because he was able to save up his smartphone from his father. But for Suman, well, distance learning means little to Suman. I was hearing Ronnie Screwwala and others, but I couldn't agree much to them because uh, the field realities when you go deeper are quite very different. For Suman, for her sister, and thousand other girls like her in the village, distance learning means very little. Believe me. they do not have access to smartphones <laughs> they are being left behind why because they are girls schools closure has widened the gender gap adolescent girls continue to be worse hit in the times of crisis their vulnerabilities have exaggerated girls are now providing informal care within families to elders to siblings taking responsibility of household chores agriculture related activities and ultimately they are what they are regressing to the disparate gender roles no school also means no midday meal no contact with peers no interaction with friends no stepping out of house complete control on adolescent girls before covid 19 hit we were acutely aware of the global learning crisis but despite huge strides we had around uh, 130 million girls out of school with so many countries still in the process of getting out of lockdown we can only estimate the impact that covid crisis will have as more than 1.5 million children globally are out of school 
but the big question is now uh, when schools reopen will our girls return the challenge of access will or once again raise its head we have to look at it evidence for previous health crisis say in african countries point to that the number of girls out of school tripled when they went through such kind of crisis this is the reality and we have to face it and so this has been of huge concern to me to us to our organization and hence our covid response has been planned with the issues of out of school girls as the forefront of our minds and the strategy that has been designed around three phases relief recovery and reimagining education system all through gender lens so if we look at relief as an education focused ngo our priority is always children but in these unprecedented times if we as civil society haven't had an immediate response to help alleviate hunger and the risk of deepening poverty our children would have suffered even more and would have borne the weight of the crisis for this reason we have pivoted to support government with food distribution awareness building and signposting to social security schemes that's the only hope for these people in some of the poorest and most marginalized villages and it isn't a surprise that these are the villages with the highest concentration of out of school children especially girls in terms of recovery the pandemic has hit education system on many levels and the road to recovery will be too long we have to accept that all the gains that we had made in the past with enrollment retention learning may potentially be undone as schools prepare to reopen we have to prioritize prioritize our work our strategies in the same manner retention enrollment learning and work accordingly before we tackle the inevitable impact on learning solely as far as hunger is concerned even in normal times girls are the last one to eat and whatever is left in the home in rural areas it is still there it's not that i'm speaking out of something it's the experience what we had seen through our own eyes so to address this schools needs to extend mid day meal probably they should provide with breakfast as well in there and also encourage some take away food packages and they should also take care of the children who belong to migrant families and who are coming back to the villages uh tracking and monitoring of such type of schemes will also uh need to be more critical and tightened up ever than before we as educated girls have we have leveraged our existing community and government relationships the data which was available to reach the last mile distribute food to close to 1 lakh families households in the implementation area where we work in terms of safety and access we need to generate mass awareness on the need for children particularly young girls to be back in school and we need to activate community mobilization to make this sustainable even though there is uncertainty around when the schools will open we have to start now to leverage our communities to create the demand for girls education which is stooping right now but we need to work over it today during the lockdown our 13000 plus team balika volunteers are reaching out to parents uh, through whatsapp through sms calls through phone calls or even through the local volunteers who are available in the vicinity of the mohalla we are calling for an expanded role of school administration not just teachers but school administration also needs to be in action right now and also encourage smcs sdmcs to engage more on attendance as we are asking for increased capacities for girls in residential hostels tribal hostels where they can stay back and probably even a cash transfer should be considered to attract and retain girls in schools so my story illustrates well the emotional toll uh, the lockdown has had on children so emotional wellbeing of children needs to be worked upon domestic violence is on the crisis this is affecting the emotional health of the adolescent girls they need significant inputs in form of counseling to combat emotional stress 
anxiety after lockdown. Now we need to see psychological support initiative as an absolute priority as schools reopen. We need to reduce stress and the pressure put on our children to complete the courses, padhai karo, what are you doing on telephone or mobile and things like that. We need to help them re-engage with the full school experience as a child and overcome the trauma of pandemic. And finally, to learning, we will have to find a balance between online and offline or look for a blended method where both can come together. Substantial resources will have to go into remedial curriculum as well. And now finally, let's talk about reimagining education system. We need to reimagine education system that works for all. We know that when we design for those struggling most, we are fair to everyone and everyone gets benefited by this. We will have to tackle patriarchy and reimagine on education system where textbooks, teaching material are without gender bias. We have to look afresh at what quality education means to us. Definitely technology will play a critical role. And as we reimagine education, we need an intentional gender lens because being gender neutral means being gender blind, which should not happen. And now I would like to end on a positive note and consider that perhaps the pandemic is now offering us an opportunity to build back better. And with the approval of the national education plan last week, probably it feels like this is the beginning of a new era. So let, let's make this a new era for our girls as we India civil society try to rebuild it in a way that allows for greater equity, equality, access, inclusion, and innovation. Let's keep the story of Suman in our minds and at the center of our design for a post-pandemic world. Please Thank you so much, Suman. As I Shabnam, educate girls. Thank you so much, uh, Shabnam, for highlighting the story of a million girls in India through the eyes and uh, in the situation of Suman. Uh, in Ajmer, Rajasthan. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sure on this Independence Day, it's a wake-up call to a to a problem that has been persistent for a while. But uh, hopefully, the civil society, the government, and the business, as the earlier conversations have pointed out, will help us lead the right direction. And I would like to end that on the positive note. Inshallah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, would love to now welcome our next speaker, who probably leads uh, needs little introduction, especially in the recent times. He's the founder of IndianBloodDonors.com, uh, a site that put that actually lets blood donors and patients in need of blood connect with each other. And in the recent past, known very well for SevaKitchen.org, an initiative to serve food to the families of hospitalized patients during COVID. He's also been at the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic, facilitating food and aid to thousands of families in need. Apart from these initiatives, his day job, if I may put it that way, Kushru Poacha works actually as a superintendent with the Indian Railways in Nagpur. Uh, Mr. Kushru, it's a pleasure to have you with us and the floor is all yours. Mr. Kushru, could you please unmute yourself? Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you very much, Sriram. Uh, grateful to Naj for having me here. I don't know how I'm going to share my journey of 20 years in 15 minutes, but I'll try and I'll try my level best. As I speak to you, a patient may be critically ill, whether he lives or dies, depends on whether a unit of blood of the right type is available. Many a times a patient dies for want of blood. Many a times relatives of patients have to run from pillar to post for a unit of blood. And many a times there are unscrupulous elements selling blood in our country. There are times when people are imprisoned in farms and blood is drawn from them and sold in the market. If you read this book, The Red Market by Scott Carney, chapter number seven, you will come to know about the blood market in our country. My journey, flashback 
my journey started in 1994 when i saw a patient in a hospital from a village die for want of blood it happened again in 1999 when a friend of mine asked me to find for a o negative blood for a welder i could not and that patient passed away i and my wife then realized that we should do something and then i realized in the year 2000 that i could use the power of the internet to bring a blood donor and a patient together and then was born indianblooddonors.com it did not take off it was it was born on the 24th of march 2000 when we launched it it did not take off and in the year 2001 the gujarat earthquake happened when i saw the destruction in gujarat i immediately called up z news and requested them to put a ticker on their channel they immediately put a ticker and our website crashed within half an hour there were donors registering from all over the country finally the pay, the injured who were airlifted from guj to arm forces medical college pune a pune donors donated blood for them soon the site started getting noticed and the the electronic media and the print media started covering it by 2001 uh, october or november i was completely broke as i had put in all my resources to build indianblooddonors.com and i that then i needed money so after reading about my helpline a few corporates connected with me and they said yes what is the sponsorship you need for your helpline and i told them i need 2000 rupees per month one of the corporates agreed but with a few conditions one of the conditions was that you will share your database with us i asked why they said we would like to exploit it for commercial gains i said no i cannot do that and the the ceo of the company uttered a statement which changed my life he said mr pocha you cannot do good work without money and i really don't know what overcame me that day i replied to him sir i will prove to you and the world that good work can be done without money and that day i decided that i will never form an ngo nor an organization and continue to do what i do along with the people of the country make it a people's movement and that is how indian blood donors started to grow we start we grew from a few hundred donors to thousands of donors and over the years as of today we never you know we never kept analysis or analytics of how many donors we were patients we were actually helping but we did that since the 1999 and to, till today our helpline has collected more than 1 lakh 60000 patients with blood donors so as a helpline grew you know questions came up uh, in the big b schools where i was invited to speak about that how would a enterprise a social enterprise go grow without a revenue model and it's 20 years that i've proved them wrong slowly people corporate started joining me they started helping us with building apps building an ivrs helpline maintaining the website and so on and so over the years this has become a people's movement as of today we are now thinking we have a very everybody has a very powerful tool in their own hands that's a mobile if you all know every mobile has 400 and 400 to 500 contacts 
in every mobile and it's a very powerful tool which can be converted into a blood donor da database so that is what we are working as of today of how can we connect these mobiles all across to the country to have a bigger database of blood donors now i'll uh, fast forward to 2014 this has been my uh, second love if i may say so my mother was admitted in a hospital and uh, she was undergoing cancer treatment she had cancer of the last stage and she was admitted in a hospital for 20 days and i was with her in the hospital and every day i would get down go out for a cup of tea or a walk and i would see so many people from villages sitting on footpaths making a chapati and eating it with onion or a pickle i watched that i was really moved that these people do not even have the money for the treatment and how are they going to survive and this got me thinking and one day my mother while in hospital saw that i was very sad and down and out so she asked me kushu what makes you sad and i told her that mummy i am really touched the way the people suffer when they are in hospitals especially when they come from villages for treatment and she said two statements she said kushu why don't you start serving them the people of the world will help you my mother passed away in 6 months on the 3rd of october 2014 and i remembered my promise to her and on the 23rd of november 2014 i and my wife took 25 meals went out stood out of the hospital and distributed those 25 meals i realized that when i went there with 25 meals 150 people came for those meals and i realized that i had to do something else so from the next week we started cooking 150 meals and started serving them outside the hospital in a month or so a few friends and well wishers started approaching me that they would like to volunteer they would like to give money they would like to give material and they would like to join seva kitchen and i suddenly remembered that i had taken a vow that i would never take money so i told them if you are interested to serve come i will give you a location you make a group and you serve over there so that's how seva kitchen started to grow from one city to another city to another city to another city then in 2016 i realized that we are doing something for the relatives of the patient but what of the needy patients in the hospital they don't have access to fruits they don't have access to milk they don't have access to juices which i and you have when we are in hospital because our relatives get it for us what about the poor people who come from villages so as they say dil mange more i wanted to do something more so i came up with an idea of installing a fridge not exactly a domestic fridge but a visi cooler which you see in ice cream parlors a see through fridge and we called it the seva kitchens neki ka petara in english it would be fridge of kindness we installed it in the same hospital where my mother was uh, admitted and from day 1 it was a rush it was a success we had we made what we did was very simple a donor installed a fridge again here i did not take money from the people we found out a distributor told the donor to transfer money into the distributor's account and the distributor installed a fridge and then we made a whatsapp group who were wanted to contribute to that fridge of a list was made in the dp of the whatsapp group i am telling you all these details 
so some of you can replicate it in your community so and then i'm that- sure mr kushu i'm so sorry to uh, interrupt you we're just running a little, little short of uh, time here I'll, so just two minutes you could closing comments yeah. if you can yes. thank you so much so, yeah so this is this is what we did and seva kitchen uh, in the last 3 months during the pandemic we've collected uh, more than a crore of material and we've distributed in nagpur and surrounding areas and we still continue to do that as times are tough i will end with a very small poem which is very apt for these times it's in hindi and i'm sure you will love it it says prabhu kehte hain hoti aarti baste shank pooja mein sab hoye hai mandir ke bahar to dekho bhooke bacche soye hai ek niwala inko dena prashad mujhe chad jayega mere dar par mangne wale tujhe bin mange sab mil jayega thank you very much thank you so much shubhushu that was that was a a fitting finale to your talk on your history with seva kitchen and with uh, indianbreaddonors.com uh thank you so much uh, mr kushu thank you so much shabnam and thank you siddarth for your time and uh, insight into your own personal journeys thank you